I'm Amy Maxey, uh, faculty here at Oblate School of Theology, teaching the spirituality program. And I'm here today with Dr. Bernard McGinn, a uh, world-renowned expert on Christian mysticism, uh, whose seven-volume series, The Presence of God, has been a watershed moment in the study of spirituality and mysticism. Thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to start off our time together, how would you define the academic discipline of spirituality? I would say it's a critical reflection on uh, the lived experience of Christian faith. So it's a very wide term in that sense, but it stressed the lived experience and not just the academic. It's an academic study of exactly how Christians live their faith, especially through practice, but also through prayer, and also through their thinking about what they believe in. So it's a very wide term. Uh, Sandra Schneiders has called it a field encompassing field because it touches, it's a field that encompasses so many other different fields of study. And I would very much agree with that with that uh, de definition. So people might say, well, that's very amorphous and it's, uh, it's general. Uh, it is general, but I think part of what we've been doing in the last 50 years or so has been trying to be more specific about what that involves and about the methods that are best for studying it. Hmm. What would you say is the value of studying spirituality in the contemporary world? Well, I think the basic issue about spirituality is that it's not just the intellectual study of Christianity, it's not just uh, the legal aspects and institutional aspects of Christianity, but it gets to what's most fundamental about Christian belief, which is the action of the spirit, mm. pneuma, spiritus, which is the fundamental source of living the Christian life as against merely kind of looking at it objectively from the outside. So it always involves in some way, not only intellectual critical study, but also an engagement of the person who is doing the study. Spirituality is very difficult to be studied, I think, seriously from a very, very distant mm -hmm. kind of aspect as a, just an object that's out there. It's an object, that, something that involves you. Right. <clears throat> what would you say is the role of spirituality in the contemporary Christian conversation? Well, I think it's uh, it might emerge very, very strongly uh, I mean, it's always been there in that sense. Mm -hmm. but spirituality is part of the is part of the Christian life. If we go back to the New Testament, it's living in the spirit. It's pneuma. It's pneumaticos. Christians are supposed to be spiritual people, so it's always been there. But it's it's emergence as a way of looking at um, and studying uh, the Christian life. I think gives us a kind of uh, specificity and clarity about certain aspects of Christianity weren't that were always there but weren't looked at in a serious fashion. And that's why the emergence of spirituality as a discipline, I think, has been very, very important. And I think it's certainly been increasing and growing in the course of the last 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more about your own work in the field? What have you focused on? What kind of questions have you been trying to explore? Uh, and speak a little bit about your work on mysticism. Yes, well, I mean, I think of spirituality as a part of mysticism. I think of spirituality as, as a larger category within which mysticism, which concentrates on the uh, direct experience of God and trying to in some way understand what it means to have a direct or immediate experience of God. So mysticism for me is a part of spirituality broadly conceived. And mysticism is uh, the aspect of spirituality that I've concentrated on, uh, concentrated on the most. And um, I was always interested in the mystical texts and the great mystics from the time I was studying theology, first in the 1950s uh, and the like. But uh, what I discovered from about the 1970s on, as I was teaching, was the fact that more and more students were coming who were interested in the mystics. Mm -hmm. and interested in the history of mysticism and the tradition. And there were very good in studies of individual mystics, as there always have been, but there was almost no overview, particularly from a theological perspective. There was no overview of the whole tradition and its phenomenon. And so about 1980, I guess it was, I decided to try to write such, such a history because I knew it would be very important 
for my students, but also thought for the larger theological uh, community. My original plan was to write a substantial three volume uh, history of this Christian mysticism from its origins in the biblical uh, period down through. And what I discovered as I worked on that for 40 years was the subject grew larger and larger <laughs> and larger. So I eventually published seven volumes, actually nine volumes, because the volume six splits into three. Mm -hmm. uh, and that carried the story up to around 1700, which was a great crisis in at least Catholic mysticism due to the quietest con uh, condemnations at 1700. And uh, so that's where the nine volumes wound up. Since then, I actually, uh, just earlier this year, I finally published a book on modern mystics because I didn't want to let people think that the story ended in 1700. Mm -hmm. But it certainly went through a down period from 1700, I think, until uh, the end of the 19th, early 20th century. So my most recent book on modern mystics and introduction looked at 10 figures of the 20th century, that I, five men, five women, that I considered important and exemplary mystics. There are lots of others. Uh, I listed 40 or more names of people that I was familiar with, but I concentrated on these 10 just to get a sense of, first of all, what was different about mysticism in the 20th century mm -hmm. as compared with the classic period. And then as an example for others to say, well, the study of mysticism in contemporary figures is alive and well and needs to be pursued by people younger than I, <laughs> like yourself. <laughs> yes, which I hope to be a part of. Uh, could you say a little bit more about what is happening here at Oblate School of Theology uh, with the study of spirituality and the study of mysticism? Yes, well, I, I you know, I, I can say this uh, somewhat as an outsider, but also as a sometime insider. I think it was around uh, 2007, maybe 2008 that I was first invited to come here for uh, some uh, some conferences. And then three or four times I've been invited to come teach uh, courses, uh, you know, concentrated courses over a month period or the like. And uh, so I've come to know Oblate School very well and, and appreciate it. And uh, part of the reason I like coming here, I think it's one of the, the major centers for the study of spirituality in, in the United States with a very good faculty, very committed students, uh, library resources <laughs> that are, uh, but obviously the spirituality is being studied in uh, a number of uh, seminaries and uh, universities, uh, Catholic universities especially, around the country. But I would say there's a special concentration here at Oblate School due to faculty of uh, considerable expertise, but also great commitment to spirituality, as well as students who recognize that this is a very important center for them for them to study. So I salute uh, and I'm happy to be associated with Ablate in terms of the last 15 or 20 years from time to time. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate uh, everything that you've brought to our program and brought to our students. Do you have any encouragement for people who might be interested in learning more, getting into the study of spirituality? Well, I mean, I think, uh, again, trying to find programs where you might be able to pursue that kind of uh, study on an academic level. But I also think that um, one of the things that institutions uh, can consider, too, is running various kinds of programs that try to attract a broader uh, population and a broader uh, interest on the part of concerned uh, believers and Christians. I don't know how much Oblate, I know Oblate does something of that, but mm -hmm. I was very impressed um, going to uh, uh, Belgium, for example, and uh, with University of Nijmegen, which is now Radboud University, has the Titus Bronsma Institute for the Study of Spirituality. Which again, it's a very fine academic program, but when I visited there and lectured, they have a very broad outreach to the local population running conferences and retreats and different kinds of academic programs and the like. And I think that's something that should be uh, in, encouraged almost uh, almost everywhere because the academic study is, is very, very important and that will keep the, keep it going for the future. But then the, the dissemination of that kind of wisdom 
yeah, that's partly academic, but then also to some extent practical. And that's the way I know these Nijmegen programs work. I'm very impressed with the number of people they have coming. I asked, uh, sworn by Carmelites, I was asking the Carmelites, well, how do these programs work? And we, they say in the weekends they can have 200 people who mm. are coming, you know, to do weekend retreats, which also though have a academic uh, uh, aspect to them. Yeah, at, at Oblate, we've done a lot of continuing education here in San Antonio, uh, but with the kind of widespread move to the Zoom universe. This is it. Yep, we're finding uh, kind of new ways to reach out because there is a real hunger, I think, for spirituality um, that at least we're experiencing. Yeah, there is a group called the World Community of Christian Meditation. I don't know whether you're aware of that. These are people who are committed to the prayer form uh, that created by John Main, an English Benedictine now deceased. And they're, they're worldwide. And they have two major centers. One of them is the Meditatio Center in London. And now they have a, uh, an old uh, Cistercian monastery in France, Bonvaux. And they run uh, a tremendous amount of programs, but they've all moved into Zoom in a very big way mm. uh, and have these Zoom programs that are tuned into around the world. Uh, so, I mean, that's the future of all these things. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, my wife has often reminded me of this. I used to go to places and give a lecture to, to 50 or 60 people. I do a Zoom program for the world, the WCCM, or for our Lumen Christi Center in Chicago, and I asked them, "Well, how many people subscribe?" Oh, 600, you know, or yeah. 700, and that's just amazing. I mean, you know, 10 times as much as what I was able to, an audience that I was able to reach beforehand. Well, just to wrap up our time together, do you have any uh, thoughts about the future of spirituality? Hope for the study of spirituality. What do you think is on the horizon? Well, I think greater ecumenical outreach, not only the Christian outreach, but outreach to other traditions. Mm. Now that's been going on for the past 40 or 50 years. And I think it's been a tremendous boon, spiritual boon, if you will. I think that really needs needs to be increased and needs to be as much uh, emphasized as is, uh, as is possible. Because we live in that world. Uh, my friend, um, you had cousins now deceased, who began many of these projects like the World Encyclopedia of Spirituality, and he was in the beginning of the classics of Western spirituality. He coined the phrase global spirituality uh, decades ago now, and we're living in that era of global spirituality, mm -hmm. sometimes without realizing it. And I think that that is where one important part of where the future is greater emphasis on that global spirituality, greater sharing of traditions, uh, and uh, bringing the, the whole of the believing communities into that emphasis rather than, just, rather than just a few people. There are many others that could be mentioned, but when I think of the future of spirituality, I think of it in terms of increasing that global outreach mm -hmm. and having people realize that we are one spiritual world even though we may be unfortunately divided into different religions and denominations and the like. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your thoughts and for your time. Uh, I, I think I speak for both of us when I say that there's uh, a lot of enthusiasm and hope for the future of spirituality. Well, th thank you, Amy, very much.